Hello again and welcome to week two. I can't believe we're already at week two at Rasmussen. Um, just finished grading the week one work. Very good job. I'm very pleased with the work that we're doing here. Um, and in particular, uh, I was uh, impressed with your discussion contributions. You all made a lot of very good points. Uh, you know, some of you talked about um, you were very honest. I know um, in terms of where you were in the learning curve, a lot of you cited um, having laying out a good plan. I thought that was very good. I mean, that's key. That's key to doing a good a good uh, model. You know, to, to doing a, an effective model, knowing your audience, laying out a plan. So I was really impressed with that. Um, I like that a lot of you were very keen on labeling, labeling columns, labeling formulas. So that was very good. I thought you did a great job there. Uh, there were uh, some comments on um, uh, the power of data management. I think one of this one of you talked about how you list a lot of restaurants and things that you do on your Excel spreadsheet, which is sort of I use Excel a lot. I got to tell you, and um, that's one area where I also find it very useful. I can compile information. I keep bank account records or any bills that I owe, you know, recurring bills, utilities, things like that. Um, I find it's great, you know, and I also use it when I'm looking at different finance things, which we're going to learn here. I could look at any type of, like if I'm thinking about purchasing a car, I could work out the numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. And I think I probably, I, I don't know if I shared it. It's in my finance um, playlist. But absolutely, I would like to share at one point. Um, I've done a whole bunch. I did two videos that are really popular on leasing an automobile. So somewhere along the line, I have to remember to include those in our work. I, I don't like to do that in the beginning because I want you to get settled and work on the stuff that we have to work on. But as we move along, and if I forget, and I don't, won't, I usually don't forget. But uh, feel free to to contact me because I, I, you know, in terms of getting those videos, they're on the finance playlist. So, so, um, you know, no problem with that. You just go on the finance playlist and there's two videos. One is leasing an automobile and another one is don't get ripped off uh, by, uh, by auto dealers, which I thought was pretty, you know, catches people's attention. But what I talk about is using Excel as a spreadsheet to figure out the lease or purchase. And remember, some people say, you know, and I, I, I've heard people say, well, I, I like to pay cash out. Yeah. First of all, it's irrelevant. You know, I have to state that, and, and not students, people that I know. Yeah, I want to pay cash. Well, you know, it, it's really irrelevant. The point is, where's your money best spent? If you do have the money, hey, God bless you. If you have the money to buy a car outright, great. But you, maybe that money could be better invested somewhere else if you get zero percent financing. So really, it starts with doing the numbers. You know, whether you have the capital, or you don't have the capital. In anything you do in a business. And anything you do, it always pays to look at the numbers and see what the benefit is of borrowing the money and then reinvesting somewhere else, taking your cash and reinvesting somewhere else. But either way, you want to work the numbers out first. Lease ideas, the payment ideas. It's the same thing when we look at net present value or turn rate of return or any of those things. It's all predicated on doing the numbers, understanding the cost of capital, and seeing whether the uh, deal makes sense. So at any rate, um, let's take a look. And let's look at this week's work uh, with that in mind. I'm going to share my screen. This is this week's work. This is our. This is literal. We're going to go to our class. This man on his computer. Let's take a look. So this is you know, this is where we are right now. We're in week two. So let me show you what I did for for you guys on week two. So week two, we're going to be talking about the uh, overview and activities. And uh, by the way, if you go to my announcements and let's do that, um, well, let's open up another one. If you go to my announcements, you'll see a full guide to what I expect of you this week. So go into the announcements. And this is the preview and expectations. 
So we're focusing on different models, in particular the capital asset pricing model. And if you want to get a little bit more insight, I included my page. So there's the video on the capital asset pricing model, which I want to hold off on for a minute. And if you go to my page, that's where you find all the other finance uh, playlists. So there's my video on capital asset pricing model. And um, one thing I want you to do in the written assignment, I want you to find how to do portfolio return and standard deviation. And we give you, um, and then I give you videos on standard deviation. And the e-text offers a comprehensive guide, and I'll go over those models today. But what we want to do is find the portfolio return and standard deviation for a portfolio with a 50% allocated to each asset. Create a table of portfolio returns, graph the risks, calculate the weights. So this is what I'm expecting this week. Before we get started, I want to play this video. I'd like to play this video. Now, if the sound doesn't come in as well, the sound doesn't come in as well, watch the watch the um, closed captions. So I just want to make sure you look at this, because this is my explanation of the capitalist and pricing model. I also gave you an example uh, and like a template, along with the template the school provides, an example of a successful um, uh, homework submission in, in this particular model, because I want to give you some help. It's a little tricky, and I don't want to leave you guys, you know, fiddling with it just on your own. But let's take a look at this first. Proper discount rate and value.
space to put them. Video. All right, so I'm not going to show the next one only because I want to do more online. But I do want you to take the time before you start these um, before you start this project, and I would like for you to um, uh, go over both videos. Now you know the theory behind it. Capital asset pricing model is basically a regression. And I also have videos on how you do that regression. So that's all in the playlists. Um, and please take a look, you know, you, you'll, you'll learn a lot, you know, and that's what this is about modeling. So say for instance, you go back to my videos, let's look at my channel. What you're gonna be working on is ver a, a variance of, let's look at playlists. And we'll go to finance. Bear with me. Here we go. And you'll see that. <clears throat> close this. Um, it's a lot of good stuff here that you'll be able to use. And we talked about this last week. But calculating beta, which is a function of the capital asset pricing model. I have three parts as to how to do the beta on your own. Then you have the two parts on the capital asset pricing model. So this is all stuff that will relate because what you're doing is you're running a regression. And you're looking at your stock, whatever stock you pick versus the market and seeing what the regression is. So if your stock is moving at twice the velocity of the market, well, then you have twice the risk according to the capital asset pricing model. So you would multiply that 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 beta function, that coefficient by the return on the market. So if the markets are returning 15, five or six percent. You know your your and, and your and your relationship, your stock's relationship to the market is two. Well, then you would multiply two by five, and you get ten, and then you have to just add the risk-free rate. So you know, really quickly, if I was say looking at uh, Ford, and let's go to Yahoo Finance. picking Ford because that's the example I used. If I was looking at the Ford Motor Company, they have a beta of 1.1, almost exactly with the market. And the market rate of return is about five or 6%. And you go by the price earnings ratio. Right now, the, uh, the price earnings ratio for the S&P 500, in other words, how much investors will pay for earnings is 20 times. So if a company had a dollar of earnings in the S&P 500, they investors would pay twenty dollars for that. So if you're paying twenty dollars for one dollar of earnings, you're only looking for a five percent rate of return right now, which is better than what you would get in the bank, or on a risk-free rate, which is like one and a half percent. So it's so think of it that way. You know, one divided by twenty is going to be five percent because you're paying twenty dollars for one dollar of earnings. Well, the 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 five percent return on the market times one point one beta is going to be about and to make it easy, about 5%. And then you add the risk-free rate because you have to get paid that, otherwise you wouldn't invest. And the risk-free rate is the 10-year treasury, which is about 1.7%. So you have to subtract, not to make this more confusing, but you have to subtract out the risk-free rate from the return on the market. So it's about 5% when you do all of that. So 5% times 1.1 is 5.5%. Add 1.7% is... 7.2 percent so what you're saying according to the capital asset pricing model is the expected rate of return on Ford should be about seven percent and and that's what investors are looking for that's what they and that's what the beta of 1.1 implies now stocks that are more risky you're going to have higher betas because there's more risk in them so let's take a look at tesla tesla has a beta of almost two because what we're saying really is if uh let's look at the annotation Sometimes this could be tricky, but if, bear with me.
if the market is moving like that, then maybe Ford is almost moving just with the market, you know, drift upward drift usually because of inflation. But that Tesla is more risky. So since Tesla is more risky according to its regression against the market, and watch the videos, you would attack you would the investors are effectively going to require a higher rate or a higher rate of return because more variance equals more risk going back to your statistics. And I know a few of you mentioned in the in the uh, discussions that you know that that understanding the statistics really helped. So hopefully um, that kind of makes it clear as to uh, what we're dealing with here. Okay, and I hope that makes it clear. And if it doesn't, and if it doesn't make it clear, I want you to um, and you watch the videos and you watch the beta and you, and the regression doesn't that doesn't make it clear. Then what I would urge you to do is contact me. You know, let me know, and I'll provide you with more information. So I really want you to learn how to do this stuff. All right. So once you get there, and you're in the written assignment, you know, you have this this problem that you have to do. Find the portfolio returns. Create a table of portfolio returns. Graph the risk, and and then you're going to have to get the file, right? And and they're going to tell you, you know, they tell they, we ask you to do all of these different things. And it's essentially a review of how the capital asset price of model came about. So where first, where do you get the spreadsheet? Well, you go to lecture resources. I think it should be here. It's right here. And you got a lot of more information on how you calculate beta. Not my information, but how Excel calculates beta. More information on the calcul on the capital asset pricing model. How do I download historical performance data from a website, which I show you in those web in those in those in those videos on regression. So you could use either one. So we get it really, and then these are the this these are the um sol how to use the solver, how what the efficient frontier is, and so which was last week's code word. So you got a lot of information the school provides, but at any rate, you would download this spreadsheet and you'd work off that spreadsheet. Now, if you go to the spreadsheet, and this week's code word, this week's special word, the code word is spreadsheet. This week's code word is spreadsheet. Let this open. And when you open it, you're going to have all the information here that we're looking for. There are all the prices that we provide you with, although we do show you how to download prices if you want to do further work. And then these are the returns for the prices. That's how do you do the expected return. This is the two asset portfolio. And here's the efficient frontier. Now, that's the spreadsheet that school provides. Um, I also, for your edification, I provided an example of a successful, of a successful um, submission. And you could use both, and there you go. And you could use both to actually do your calculations. So take your time with it. It's not it, it's it's not as difficult. I mean, it's not as difficult as it appears. And it's not it's not it's not you know. I won't say that you know it doesn't require any work at all because it does. Because you do have to add in things like the weights, find the returns, answer these questions, right? Answer these questions, but using both spreadsheets using the spreadsheet with the example and using the spreadsheet provided by the school you should be able to come up with the standard deviation which is the risk which is the measure of risk right what is standard deviation if you remember from your statistics class it's the measure of dispersion from the average right we have an average rate of return and then we have the the the, 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 the variance of the of the average right we can have two for instance we can have uh, two basketball players that both scored 20 points every game, and they look equal, right? And to the untrained eye, say, "Well, they're equal." I mean, they don't. It doesn't matter. But maybe one uh, 
player has scores as you know in the fives and sixes and the thirties that equal twenty, and one has scores that are in the high teens and low twenties to equal twenty. Well, obviously the one that's closer to the mean, the guy with the high teens and low twenties, is less risky because it's more predictable, and that's what we're looking for in statistics. The measure of risk is going to be variance. It's mainly like when you drive your car. Did you ever have one of these um, things? I know Allstate does it where you put the the module in your car and it and it sees when you stop and go and they and they and they calibrate your insurance payment based on that. Well, what they're looking for is people who vary their speeds a lot and slam their brakes. Because that's going to introduce more risk. Where somebody who drives more steady, given can you know given average conditions, will be less risky. But once you do the solver and you plot the um, efficient frontier, which always looks something like this, because you're giving different combinations of the two securities. You're going to come up with a point on the curve that gives you the most return for the least amount of the most return, which is about six and a half percent, for the least amount of standard deviation, which is risk, which is going to be a blend of about 4.7 percent in XYZ and 95 percent in ABC. That's that's what that line represents. Now you would never invest on the bottom of this efficient frontier. So if this was your, your your possible combinations, given your expected returns for A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, we would never want to invest here because obviously we would get lower rates of return for more for for more risk. So we would always want to invest on this side of the portion. Here's where we would invest if we had the if we had the most risk aversion. We want the least amount of risk. We would invest right here. This way we get a six percent rate of return. And 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 uh, with, a, with, a, with a standard deviation of uh, seventeen point nine percent. Now, if we want more re return, we got to take on more risk because this represents risk. This represents deviation. Now, notice it doesn't go straight up. It's not a linear line. I wanted to point that out. And if you use calculus, and that's the way this was derived, you would find the line. The way they solved it originally was they used inferential calculus, and and they drew a line. The, the rate of change that went straight up against this line. And that was the point that was tangent to that line. And that shows you the least amount of risk. That's where the rate of change kind of equals the rates of return. But notice that if I want more return, I have to take on more risk. But it doesn't grow equally. It kind of like slopes that way, which tells us that we have to take more and more risk on a on an inc on a marginal basis to get more return. And that's one of the things I want you to take out of this. That if you're shown in your travels uh, an efficient return, and, and insurance companies will do this, and brokerage firms will do this, they'll show you the efficient frontier based on a blending of, of different um, assets, you are going to see this efficient frontier. And you'll never want to invest on this side. You'll never want combinations of securities down here because you're getting more risk. You're getting more, more risk for less return. But you're going to want maybe to have the least amount. Some people would naturally say, well, I'd like them most return for least amount of risk and if you're totally risk averse fine but you might say no i do want eight percent i need eight percent to live well then notice that to go from six to eight i've got to increase my standard deviation from about 18 to 25 and we could see that here and so if you're willing to live with that risk then you will take the incremental risk but one thing we learn about the markets and in most markets is i get less and less return for more and more risk and that's something i want to factor in. Now, is that just math? No, it's not just math. It's it's the fact is everybody wants more return. Who doesn't want more return? Especially people investing their money. Everybody wants more return. Everyone wants the best deal for their money. Even when you go to the shopping center, everybody wants the best deal for their food, you know, best deal for protein, the best deal for, for, for everything I buy for produce. And the suppliers want the best deal for them. So the demanders and suppliers are always going against each other or trying to get the best possible efficient deal, and that's what we call it efficiency, and we somehow meet at a place where both sides are, are, are willing to make a deal. However, to get more return, we have to take on more and more risk because of the nature of risk. More people are searching for it, so they're going to drive up the prices, and that's going to equal more deviation. You know, If I'm paying more for something right off the bat, that's going to create more deviation for me based on where the stock ultimately trades. So you have all your information here. This is the example, and this is the the really the spreadsheet of where what the different weights would be if I if I um, if I take care of that if I plug all that in. 
So that is really it's a, it's 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 not you know it's one of the more difficult things you're gonna have to do in this um, in this class. But if you take your time, use my examples, and I put those examples there for a reason. You're gonna find that um, it's uh, well worth it. It's well worth it, and you're gonna um, be happy that you did that. Very happy that you did that. So, and this is a knowledge check. So this is going to take you through calculating monthly returns, finding historical ad averages, and and submitting this knowledge check. So I want you to do that also. So that's it for this week. Um, uh, there's your example for review. There's your written assignment. Let's look at the discussion. Oh, there is no discussion. I should mention that. We don't get discussions again until week five or six. However, you know, don't forget, you have the messages. You haven't sent me any messages yet, which is fine. You guys are doing great. Everybody's submitting. Everybody's doing terrific. Uh, but make sure that um, if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. You can reach me via, via, um, you can reach me via a, um, a text message. You can reach me via an email, however you need to reach me. But, you know, that's going to be the work for this week. Again, I would spend a little time watching the videos on a standard deviation. I got a ton of them. I'm running beta regressions. I have those too. But the school also does a great job of providing that. I guess the capitalist and pricing. I mean, they really do a good job. So I know I sound like a cheerleader, but it's good work. And there's more on the capitalist and pricing model. So there's no reason, given my videos and everything else, that you shouldn't be able to walk away with a real firm understanding of how this works, how the CAPM works. Um, that's it for today. Uh, well, con I don't think we, I just want to check. We don't have any participants, which is fine. Just send me the code word and I'll give you credit. But uh, I appreciate you uh, watching the video. Um, I hope you're enjoying the class. So far, you're doing great. Uh, and again, I gave you an example so you could see if your work is right, because I know this is tricky. But I'll continue to help you like that. But just make sure you take the time and review it and get this job right, you know, because this will help you. And because I'm going to tell you, when you look for, ins you know, like insurance policies or investments or anything like that, they will show you versions of the efficient frontier. All right. Thank you for attending and we'll see each other next week.